I trust MSNBC more than Fox News, and I make no apologies for this. I remember a time when I would not have held either in especially high regard, but to acquaint oneself with the subject of logic is to be subsequently dazzled by the differences between them. So in order to explain this conclusion, I must first explain a little about logic. You see, logic is a tool, and like any tool, it is absolutely fair. It doesn't care about your ethnic group, your gender, or your sexual identity. It doesn't care about anything except whether you use it right. Like any tool, if you use it right, it works, and if you don't, it doesn't, and that's that. You see, at least 99.99999% of the people in, in the entire history of the world have used logic at one time or another. But most of these people did not know that it was logic they were using. And that's a problem, because once you know how to identify when you are using logic, you can use it a lot more often, in a lot more cases. The building block of a logical argument is the proposition. A proposition is a statement which can be either true or false. McDonald's sells fries is one example. McDonald's sells shrimp is another. One is true and the other is false, but both are examples of propositions. If somehow you were a newcomer to the developed world who had never heard of McDonald's, you could track one down and test these claims for accuracy because these claims are able to have accuracy. McDonald's fries are terrible does not count because this is not something that can be either true or false. In order for McDonald's fries to be either wonderful or terrible, there must first be someone there to see them that way. This is an opinion, and an opinion only exists if someone has it. Nothing can be wonderful or terrible unless someone is there to find it wonderful or terrible. There are two categories of propositions. Propositions which support, which are called premises, and propositions which are supported, which are called conclusions. And sometimes A can support B, and B can support C, which makes B a conclusion to A, but a premise to C. That is, B is a conclusion in one syllogism, but a premise in another. For example, All squares are rectangles. All rectangles are parallelograms. Therefore, all squares must be parallelograms. All squares are parallelograms. All parallelograms are quadrilaterals. Therefore, all squares must be quadrilaterals. You see, in this case, all squares are parallelograms is a conclusion in the first syllogism, but a premise in the second. Norwich is in Chenango County. Chenango County is in New York State. Therefore, Norwich must be in New York State. Norwich is in New York State. New York State is in the United States. Therefore, Norwich must be in the United States. In this case, Norwich is in New York State is a conclusion in the first syllogism, but a premise in the second. Now, you may have already known that all squares are, are parallelograms and that Norwich is in the United States, but if you hadn't, you could have figured it out from the given premises in these examples. Here are a couple of rhetorical questions for you. First, is this really difficult to understand? Second, You've had occasion to use this, haven't you? One good way to identify instances of logic is by looking at the propositions one precedes or has preceded with the word therefore. Those are conclusions. Not all conclusions manifest this way, but everything that manifests this way is a conclusion. When one is using the word therefore, one is, one is using, trying to use, or trying to create the appearance of using logic. Now the two types of reasoning are deductive and inductive. The difference lies in what it means for a given argument to be logical. Logic only describes the relationship between the given premises and the given conclusions. The question, is this argument logical, only asks, do the given premises support the given conclusions? In the case of a deductive argument, being logical means that if the given premises are true, there is no way for the given conclusions to be false. When a deductive argument is logical, that means that if the given premises are true, the truth of the given conclusions follows necessarily. Of course, whether the most basal premises are true is not something logic establishes. It is an important consideration, yes, but not a consideration of logic. That has to be established by other means, with other tools, which I will get into shortly. On the other hand, with an inductive argument, the assessment, this argument is logical, only means that if the given premises are true, the given conclusions are probably true. Inductive conclusions have a margin of error 
which could necessitate revising one's conclusions in the event that additional premises are presented. For example, City X is in the United States. The United States is mostly in North America. Therefore, City X is probably in North America. Do you see how that works? Based on this information about City X, if these premises are true, there is still the slight possibility that the given conclusion isn't. City X might not be in North America. It probably is, but might not be. The possibility exists that additional information will show us that City X is actually in Hawaii or Puerto Rico, which would make it part of the United States, but not part of North America. This possibility exists, and so we choose our words accordingly. Such and so is an attorney. Attorneys are usually conservative. Therefore, such and so is probably conservative. You see how this works? The given conclusion is completely supported by the given premises, but still contains a margin of error. The possibility exists that reason will obligate us to revise the conclusion in the event that additional premises are presented. Such and so is an attorney affiliated with the ACLU. Most attorneys affiliated with the ACLU are liberal. Therefore, such and so is probably liberal. So now we have a better conclusion, but reason still obligates us to be open to the possibility that additional premises will support a different conclusion. Many a philosopher, scientist, and logician is annoyed by the tendency of Dr. Watson to use the words brilliant deduction, when over and over again what Sherlock Holmes just carried out was in fact an act of induction. If one is trying to solve a mystery, like a detective or a scientist, the reasoning one is using is inductive. Each new clue is a premise which provides more information about the mystery one is trying to solve. As one comes into the possession of more and more information, more and more clues, it is ridiculous to be unwilling to revise one's conclusions to account for the new clues. Logic is sometimes confused with validity, and that is understandable. Validity is only one manifestation of logic. It applies only to deduction. If I say this argument is logical, all I mean is that the given premises support the given conclusions. This support could be deductive or inductive, but as long as it is there, the argument in question is logical. If, on the other hand, I say this argument is valid, I'm saying that if the given premises are true, which could be a big if, there is no way that the given conclusions could be false. A valid argument is both logical and deductive, by definition. There's also the concept of soundness. All sound arguments are valid, but not all valid arguments are sound. Again, soundness pertains only to deductive reasoning. A given argument could be logical and valid, yet still obviously absurd. For example, all men are figs. Socrates was a man. Therefore, Socrates must have been a fig. The given premises in this case completely support the given conclusion, leaving no room for the given conclusion to be false if the given premises were true, but they are not true. Therefore, this argument is valid, that is, deductively logical, but not sound. Now, if you want to make a rational case to me about anything, you have to begin either with premises that I can directly observe for myself, or premises that I can independently verify for myself, or premises that I already accept. And this is one reason it is important to know one's audience. Your most basal premises have to fall into one of these categories. You then have to be careful to make certain that each of your conclusions is completely supported by those premises. Now, if I point to a certain claim you make in your argument and ask, how do you know that? That means that so far, the claim in question does not fall into one of these categories, unless, of course, I have missed it. That happens sometimes. Thus, it falls to you to provide me with, me with support for it that does fall into one of these categories, to make a conclusion of it before you can use it as a premise, that is, to support it before you use it to support something else. There are three ways an argument can break down. First, for one of the given premises to be unfounded or demonstrably false. Second, for one of the given conclusions not to be completely supported by the given premises. And third, for one of those conclusions to be demonstrably false anyway such that you can tell there's a problem in the argument somewhere, even though you can't quite put your finger on exactly where. In assessing an argument, you have to look for all three. You have to ask yourself these three questions. First, are there any premises here which are unfounded or demonstrably false? Second, are there any conclusions here which are not completely supported by the given premises? And third, are there any conclusions here which, although completely supported by the given premises as far as I can tell, which are themselves well-founded as far as I can tell, are demonstrably false anyway? Now let's compare the MOs of MSNBC and Fox News. MSNBC takes an argument that Fox News made previously and points to one of these problems with it, points to one of these ways in which the argument from Fox News actually breaks down.
Fox News, on the other hand, just points and calls the argument or the arguer elitist or Marxist or socialist or leftist or liberally biased, yes, or etc., etc., or something along those lines. Or they refute the argument by dishonestly misrepresenting it. That is, by claiming that it says something it really doesn't. Or they rely on some other logical fallacy. The more logical fallacies one knows how to recognize, the more one is going to see. But as this progresses, with Fox News, one realizes that these fallacies are practically the rule, while with MSNBC, they are the exception. When one sees such a fallacy on MSNBC, it's because someone has slipped up, and usually the given conclusions still stand. When one sees such a fallacy on Fox News, it's because someone is being deliberately misleading. There are three valid criticisms of an argument. It has at least one premise which is not well founded, it has at least one conclusion which is not well supported by its premises, and although it passes the first two tests, it has at least one conclusion which is demonstrably false anyway. Every instance of one of these is a legitimate criticism. I grew up totally immersed in conservative rhetoric. It was everywhere. There was no getting away from it. I passed many an hour in my father's care listening to the likes of Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity. I also passed many an hour doing my own thing at my grandparents' house with my grandfather, listening to Imus in the morning in the background. Never once did Rush, Imus, my father, or my grandfather ever suggest that I should get both sides of the argument and decide for myself. I remember one day in eighth grade, my father picked me up after school, and while walking to the car, he lamented that my school was, as he described it, quote, 65% minority. I pointed out the contradiction, and that was pretty much the end of that discussion. Then one day, I was actually exposed to the refutation for an argument I had been raised on, an argument which had always been presented to me with the claim that there was no refutation. The refutation in question was not difficult to understand or remember, so every time after that, that this particular argument was reiterated, immediately afterward, the refutation would cross my mind. Then would come the claim that there was no refutation, and I knew that it was not true. How can I possibly know the refutation for an argument if there isn't one? Surely the fact that I know it demonstrates that there is. How can this individual have gone his, because it usually was a guy, entire career without ever having encountered this particular refutation? Why is he feeding this claim to his audience? Why is he feeding it to them constantly, over and over and over again? Either he lives in a cave, or he is being flat out dishonest. Between that time and now, I have investigated countless such arguments and found countless refutations I never knew about. And now, I'm being given the insistence that I should be sure to hear both sides. Apparently, having spent years of one's life completely immersed in one side does not count as having heard it. My goodness, what does? Fox News' way of doing business is by doing everything in their power to persuade their audience to basically just stop paying attention to other news sources. Unless, of course, they are likewise owned by News Corp. After all, if News Corp can monopolize the information you get, they can control the information you get, which means they can control you. So on one side, we have Bill O'Reilly, making the case that Barack Obama should be drawn and quartered. And on the other, we have Geraldo Rivera, making the case that he should only be tarred and feathered. So you see, we really do give you both sides in a fair, balanced account. You won't find that on MSNBC. <laughs> How come the typical conservative only cares about making sure you get both sides when there's a danger that the conservative side is not one of them? How come when the conservative side is the only one you're getting, that's perfectly all right? If you are going to appeal to a sense of fairness, do so fairly.